Before we dive in, imagine you're standing on the front lines of knowledge itself, where every click of a subscribe, every spark of a like, and every thoughtful comment powers a global conversation that truly matters. From the team here at Daily News AI, thank you for fueling independent insight. Together we can chase the facts faster than any missile and light up the algorithm like a night sky full of tracer rounds. Now let's buckle up for the journey ahead. And if you value this kind of in-depth reporting, go ahead and hit those buttons right now. You know the drill, but tonight we're making it count. Everybody's asking the same question. Are we actually ready for the war nobody wants but everyone fears? The recent tit-for-tat strikes between Iran and Israel ripped away the comforting notion that modern conflict stays small, surgical and far away. Suddenly whole regions have to picture swarms of low-flying drones cutting through the night, ballistic missiles arcing over borders and fifth-generation stealth fighters prowling the edge of radar range. It's no longer academic to wonder how a major Arab state, Egypt in particular, might cope if it found itself pulled directly into the blast radius of that rivalry. Egypt is a compelling case study because its geography places it within reach of both Iranian drones launched from proxy territories and Israeli aircraft operating just minutes away. Yet Cairo has spent the past decade weaving one of the most eclectic multi-layered air and missile defence quilts on Earth, betting that diversity and network integration can outmuscle even the most advanced single manufacturer shield. So how real is that deterrence? What would it take to keep Egypt's skies clear if the storms that pounded Tehran and Tel Aviv last week shifted south toward the Nile Delta? Let's zoom in system by system, tactic by tactic, and test the assumptions. Picture the structure as a pyramid, an appropriate image for Egypt, built in overlapping tiers of range and altitude. At the summit stand, long-reach guardians, such as the Russian-built S-300 VM Anti-2500 and the Chinese HQ-9B, flanked now by brand-new German Iris T SLX units. Each one tracks targets well beyond 180 miles, scans high-angle ballistic trajectories and snaps its missiles skyward to kill at heights that once belonged only to stratospheric U-2s. These batteries sit in hardened revetments carved into desert escarpments and granite foothills. They're connected by fibre-optic arteries tunnelled deep underground, and many can fold into mountain caverns before satellite passes, sealing behind blast doors thicker than the hull of a submarine. That alone would intimidate most adversaries, but the plateau below is where the real magic happens. A dense lattice of Buck M2E launchers, Iris TSLM trucks and upgraded Pechora 2M rails patrol the mid-altitudes and the 30 to 50 mile bubble around every critical city, base, dam, refinery and reactor. Because each family uses different seekers, active radar, passive infrared, command guided, semi-active, the attacking pilot or missile designer faces a jigsaw of frequencies, waveforms and heat signatures impossible to jam with a single blanket, knock out a book and an iris battery may still have a clean shot. Spoof the iris and the Pecora's radar might burn through your deception. It's redundancy by design, and it gums up an enemy's planning timeline like sand thrown into a gearbox. That picture flows through RSC-3, Egypt's indigenous command and control network. Think of it as a universal translator. Russian search radars chat seamlessly with German battle management software. Chinese launchers get firing data from American-supplied Sentinel screens. Legacy Analog sets pipe raw plots into digital fusion nodes that tag and track up to 2,000 airborne contacts at once. Engineers added firewalls and air gap valves to make sure a malware packet riding on one vendor's radio can't pogo to another vendor's launcher. One Egyptian officer summarized it this way. If a stealth jet pops on a low-band meter radar, the nearest Western infrared battery sees the cue and doesn't care who spoke first, as long as the missile goes home. But hardware and code tell only half the story. Survivability depends on posture. Unlike Iran's static emplacements, flat pads ringed by berms visible from Google Earth, most Egyptian sites sit under a thick lid of earth or inside hills. 
Access tunnels snake in like ant colonies, letting crews winch, launch rails onto hydraulic lifts, fire, drop back down and roll to a secondary shaft kilometres away. Decoy locations inflatable or welded from scrap mimic those firing signatures. Satellite snapshots reveal the same rectangular hatches, the same heat bloom, the same radar side lobes. Strike planners must therefore allocate precious warheads to every dot on the map, unsure which ones are scarecrows and which hold live missiles. Let's stress test the theory with the nightmare target, the Aswan High Dam. Hydrologists say breaching its granite core would unleash a wall of water racing north at the speed of a sprinting horse, erasing dozens of Nile towns before petering out near Cairo's outskirts. In military terms, the dam is a Type 1 existential objective, the kind of structure that automatically escalates any conflict to national survival. So, what would it take to crack that shell? Defence analysts who run Monte Carlo models keep arriving at the same sobering figure, a first wave of no fewer than 150 precision munitions, launched in unison, so that decoys, jammers, radar killers and bunker busters all arrive within a two-minute window. Only that density stands a chance of saturating the triangulated nets around Aswan. Nets that can simultaneously assign roughly 90 interceptors to unique tracks while feeding drone hunting guns with bearing data for anything slipping beneath the radar horizon. Suppose a hostile strategist greenlights the package. He still faces the problem of real-time targeting. While his cruise missiles skim south across the Red Sea, tour vehicles at Aswan can relocate three times. Radar domes on rails pop up in different orchards, Iris-T launchers sweep to fresh angles, every kilometre they scoot redraws the triangulation geometry and twists the kill boxes. By the time those warheads arrive, the cues baked into their guidance chips may point to empty dust. What about spying by satellite? Egypt staggers its moves between known overpasses and lights up generators inside mock sites to spoof thermal scans. Add nighttime weather over the upper Nile, where Sahara and equatorial humidity wrestle to make patchy cloud, and you get a reconnaissance headache that not even the newest anti-spoofing AI has fully solved. Let's shift perspective and learn from the recent Iran-Israel shootout. Israel showcased its Iron Dome, David Sling and Arrow batteries with spectacular intercept videos, yet the surprise was how close saturation truly came to cracking that armour when salvos crested a thousand inbound objects. For 45 minutes, coastal towns braced for impact, while war room officers whispered about interceptor inventories dipping below single digits. Iran, meanwhile, banked on long-range drones and older S-200 clones to defend its skies, but the moment stealth jets slipped through a seam and decapitated one radar cluster, cascading outages rippled across the grid. Within half an hour, Tehran's crews could no longer pass targeting data to adjacent batteries, leaving gaping jaws in coverage just as ballistic missiles screamed in. Egypt's planners took copious notes. They accelerated deliveries of passive multi-static radars that piggyback on civilian FM radio reflections. Radars impossible to kill with conventional anti-radiation seekers because they emit nothing. They drilled hot swap protocols where a reserve Iris T truck sits silent until its counterpart fires, then powers up on a fresh frequency and sleds 10 miles east, ready to engage the second wave. That rotation is human-driven but AI-orchestrated. Tablets on each launcher flash coloured arrows, telling drivers which sand track to take next, ensuring no two assets share the same GPS coordinates for more than 30 minutes in wartime. Think of it as a shell game played at 80 kilometres per hour. Skeptics point out that even brilliant engineering can choke on logistics. Maintaining spare parts for Russian, Chinese, German and US kit inside one hangar sounds like a customs officer's nightmare, especially under export sanctions. Cairo's workaround has been aggressive local licensing. Factories on the outskirts of Alexandria now machine their own Iris T tail fins from German-supplied blueprints, while a joint venture near Helwan CNC cuts tour servo gears. The more components homegrown, the smaller the sanction chokehold. And on the training side, Egypt has built a synthetic desert, a VR dome, where crews practice live-fire sequences against projected swarms of Mach 3 decoys, hypersonic glide shapes and drone clouds steered by machine-learning algorithms. No bullets fly, but the stress is real. 
Instructors yank bandwidth, inject jamming, and pop flashbangs behind trainees to mimic cockpit concussions. Still, there's an elephant lurking in the ready room. None of these platforms has fought a sustained peer state air campaign. Real war always writes new rules. Sensors fog up, cables snap, batteries drain faster than spec sheets claim. That uncertainty led Egypt to adopt what officers call cascading grace. If the primary and secondary intercept lines both fail, ground forces fall back on contending the airspace with field artillery firing programmable airburst rounds. It's ugly, loud and far from elegant. But a ten-second wall of tungsten fragments can shred a drone swarm and buy vital minutes for the strategic layer to reset. Cascading grace is less about expecting catastrophe than accepting its probability and embedding recovery in the playbook. Now blend all these layers into one mental image. A hostile drone glides stealthily across the Red Sea at midnight. Passive twin-vis sensors riding faint TV tower echoes mark its shadow 250 miles out. That ghost blip marches across grid squares on wall-sized displays inside Cairo's central operations bunker, colour-coded by threat level. A tour unit near Hurghada receives an automatic slewing command but holds fire. Why waste a missile when a coastal frigate's 76mm deck gun can loft a proximity-fused shell? Within 90 seconds, the drone vanishes in a blossom of sparks. The system logs the engagement, suggests relocating the tour to a new hide site in case the attack was only a probe, and rebalances tasking so no corridor remains underwatched. Human commanders oversee rather than micromanage, conserving attention for dilemmas algorithms can't yet solve, like reading the political tea leaves when the phone lines crackle with diplomatic threats. That political calculus matters because deterrence isn't about achieving a perfect score sheet. It's about convincing the adversary that the cost of trying is unacceptably high and maddeningly uncertain. Egypt's defence web, for all its complexities, pushes uncertainty into the attacker's lap. Multiple suppliers mean multiple counter-countermeasures. Mobile launchers backed by underground nests force an enemy to plan not one strike but three. First against decoys, then against hardened silos, then against fast-moving reinforcements. Each added layer inflates the bill in dollars, material and prestige. At some point, the ledger tips and rational generals look elsewhere for weaker pressure points. The next frontier, hypersonic glide vehicles, autonomous drone wolf packs, microwave surface attack, demands perpetual adaptation. Cairo is already prototyping laser dazzlers to blind electro-optical seekers, rail-mounted electromagnetic launchers to fling kinetic slugs at Mach 7, and AI gatekeepers that can arbitrate fire or no fire decisions within milliseconds while still looping a lawyer approved human in the chain. None of that future kit will matter if it fails to merge with the existing backbone, so RISC 3's architects left spare computing lanes and modular API hooks ready for yet to be imagined sensors. One engineer likened it to, well, installing USB ports on a spaceship long before anyone invents the next peripheral. All of which circles back to the opening question, is Egypt, indeed, is any state in the Middle East, truly ready for a 21st century air war? Absolute safety is a mirage. What Cairo has built is something subtler, a mesh that can bend violently without breaking, heal faster than it bleeds, and punish anyone reckless enough to test its integrity. The model's genius lies not in any single missile or radar, but in the way hundreds of disparate fins, tubes, chips and fibre strands pulse together as one distributed organism. If that organism keeps evolving, absorbing fresh code, fresh doctrine, fresh alliances, it stands an excellent chance of denying the sky to anyone who shows up uninvited. So, as regional adversaries trade ever flashier toys and bragging rights, the lesson from Egypt is surprisingly old-school resilience beats flash, integration trumps quantity, and the smartest shield is one whose outline the enemy can never fully map. Whether over Aswan's granite crown, the gleaming runways of Cairo West, or the brand-new reactor domes at Dabar, that invisible canopy is quietly rewriting strategic math across the Middle East. It may not headline the next arms fair brochure, but its presence, felt yet unseen, whispers a simple deterrent mantra, strike here and nothing will end the way you expect.
If you've stayed with us through this deep dive, you already know how critical nuanced perspectives are in a media landscape awash with quick takes. Help keep the signal strong. Tap subscribe so you never miss an episode. Smash that, like so the algorithm knows serious analysis still has a place online, and drop your own insights below. Every comment is fuel for the next investigation. Together we're decoding the news, stripping out the noise, and turning complexity into clarity. Until next time, this is Daily News AI signing off, but the conversation continues with you.